We endeavor each month to remind ourselves of the covenant that we have made with God and with one another. By reading our church covenant, it reads, Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge and holiness, to give it a place in our affections, prayers, and services above every organization of human origin, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrine, to contribute cheerfully and regularly as God has prospered us towards its expenses for the support of a faithful and evangelical ministry among us, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel throughout the world. In case of difference of opinion in the church, we will strive to avoid a contentious spirit, and if we cannot unanimously agree, we will cheerfully recognize the right of the majority to govern. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotion, to study diligently the Word of God, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintance, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be kind and just to those in our employ, and faithful in the service we promise others, endeavoring in the purity of heart and goodwill towards all men to exemplify and commend our holy faith. We further engage to watch over, to pray for, to exhort, and to stir up each other unto every good word and work, to guard each other's reputation, not needlessly exposing the infirmities of others, to participate in each other's joy, and with tender sympathy bear one another's burdens and sorrows, to cultivate Christian courtesy, to be slow to give or take offense, but always ready for reconciliation, being mindful of the rules of the Savior in the 18th chapter of Matthew to secure it without delay, and through life, a medieval report and good report, to seek to live to the glory of God, who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And when we remove from this place, we engage as soon as possible to unite with some of the church where we can carry out the spirit of the, this covenant and the principles of God's word. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment in time that you have given unto us, that we can enter into your holy presence, and for that we say thank you. Thank you for every good and every perfect gift for salvation, for sanctification, for just walking with us each and every day, Lord. We confess and repent of our sin, knowing that we have sinned against thee, against your word, and yet you're faithful and just that if we will confess our sin, that you will forgive us. And so we ask, Lord, forgive us today for anything that we may have done that is not pleasing in your sight. And Lord, we want to be vessels of honor fit for thine use. Thank you for loving us and then help us with all of our being to love you, Lord, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Thank you, Lord. This is our prayer this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray in the church that amen. Our preaching theme for the year is from God's perspective, taken from Isaiah 55, 8, where God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. And so we must endeavor to know what thus saith the Lord and gain God's perspective. And so doing today, we want to look at the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 5. Begin reading at verse number 11 down through verse 14, verse 11 of Second Chronicles chapter 5. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified. 
and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, and of Jedunan, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. And it came to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, that when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Let the church say amen. amen. From the book of Second Chronicles, chapter number 5, verses 11 through 14, I'd like to preach the word of God today, church, from this thought, oneness in worship. Oneness in worship. From God's perspective, oneness in worship. It was King David who desired to build a temple unto the Lord, a place where the presence of the Lord would be permanently among his people, as it was with the tabernacle when the children of Israel were journeying through the wilderness. But David desired that, they, that there would be a temple built unto the Lord. And though the Lord did not permit David to build the temple, David made preparations for the building of the temple, and it was his son Solomon then that God would allow to build the temple. After many years of the building process, the temple was completed, and Solomon brought together then all of the people to then dedicate the house of the Lord. We pick up then in the book of Second Chronicles chapter 5, where Solomon has assembled all of the people for the work has been completed. And there will be sacrifices then that will be brought to recognize that it is God who has enabled them to be where they are and to be able to have built the temple that will be dedicated to him. Interestingly then, after the priests have uh, taken care to place in the temple all of the articles that were to be placed in the temple. Verse number 11 picks up and says that when they came out of the holy place, that then something interesting began to happen. Those who were the priests who had been assigned the responsibility to help at, and minister at the tabernacle, and the Levites, who were their helpers, they began to then play instruments, and then they began to sing unto the Lord. Well, now the people were there too, and although it doesn't say it in the uh, verses before us, we can presume that the people who were assembled were also participating in the instruments and the singing and the sounding of joy in the house of the Lord. And church, I would submit that that ought to always be the case. It ought to be some joyous sounding in the house of the Lord. Amen. The, the, the church, church ought not ever be like a, 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 a morgue, a place where there are just bodies there. The church, the church ought not ever be cold, church. The church ought to always have some, something that, and, and we'll see it in the next verse, the church ought to always have something that it can praise God for. For well, the next verse, verse 13 says, Now as the trumpeters and the singers 
Watch this. We're as one. There was something about being together that those who were playing instruments, but then those who were singing, it was as one. It was seamless. It was togetherness. It was that they, and let, watch this, to make one sound together. That means that they, they had to be together in what they were doing. They, they weren't pulling in different directions. And there, there wasn't an attitude over here and an attitude over there and an attitude. Everybody had the same attitude. And that attitude was, let's praise the Lord together. They were making one sound to be heard in what? Praising and thanking the Lord. This presupposes, walk with me church, this presupposes that God has already done something for them before they get there that qualifies that they ought to be able to praise God and thank God not for what he's about to do but what God has already done. And I submit to you today, church, sometimes, and I'm going to close my eyes and cover my eyes when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Sometimes folk roll up in the house of the Lord and act like they don't know they got something to praise God for. If you look at your life just the past seven days, you ought to find something that God is worthy to be praised. And if you go back further than seven days, everybody in here ought to be telling God, Lord, I thank you. When they came to church, they already had a reason to be praising God and telling God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You know, sometimes it ought to just be a ringing of thank you, Lord, going on in the church. And you don't, you don't have to explain to everybody else why you saying thank you, Lord. You knew. You knew. It was nobody but the Lord. You knew that if folk on the job had their way, you wouldn't even have a job right now. You knew. There's something you ought to be able to tell God thank you for. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and instruments of music, and here's what they said. For the Lord is good. Do you know that today, church? God is good. God is good. His mercy endured forever. Aren't you glad that Lord's mercy don't run out? Aren't you glad that the mercy of the Lord endures not just for a little while, but forever? The Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. And now, there are those who say, what happened here was that praises went up. Praises ascended from the house of God. But notice this. Then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. The glory of the Lord manifests itself in the presence of the house of the Lord among the people of God when they praise God and thank God just because he is God and he loves them. 
rewind. The glory of the Lord manifests itself in the presence of the people of the Lord when they were willing to not hold back and praise God and tell God thank you. Now, I want to be careful because I don't want to uh, misread the good intent of others. Because there are people who with good intent uh, say that when praises go up, blessings come down. But in the text before us, it was the Lord himself in his glory that descended. So I want to warn us to not allow ourselves that if we use the phrase, when praises go up, blessings come down, to not equate blessings with stuff and material measurements of the presence of the Lord. Because I'm walking in the text right now. When praises went up, it don't say a new car came down. It don't say a new house came down. It didn't say more money came down. But when God heard his people praise him and say, thank you, Lord, the Bible says, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Can you imagine today that if we would praise the Lord and praise him right and tell God, thank you, what would happen in this place? The presence and the power of the Lord was so manifest that verse 14 says the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. So that means this by application. When the presence of God is manifest, even if Minister Dawson is ministering on the piano, the Spirit of God will be so powerful, so overwhelming that he may actually have to stop playing because of the presence of the glory of God. But him stopping play on the piano shouldn't stop the praise of God going on in the sanctuary. Even though the priest could not minister, yet the praise of God was not interrupted just because the priest couldn't do what he normally did. Well, church, when we love God and roll up in here like we know we got something to tell God, thank you for. When we come in here and don't act like we doing God a favor. When we allow ourselves to be free in our praise of God, free to clap my hand, free to wave my hand, free to pat my feet, free to open my mouth, and with no drum and no piano, be able to stand and say, Lord, I thank you for what you've done in my life. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing right now. Watch and see how God go to move in church. Hey. Hey. 
just as it happened here. And watch this. This ain't the first time. If you go back to Exodus chapter 40, when Moses finished the tabernacle, same thing happened. The glory of God showed up because they had been obedient and did what God told them to do. And they brought those things that God told them to bring, that there would be a tabernacle built. What the first time? Later on, Isaiah tells us, in the year King Uzziah died, guess what happened? God let me see something. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Where was he? In the temple. In the house of the Lord. And God's glory filled the house. I'm on my way home, church. Oneness in worship. The question becomes that if God has done it before, the question that you press me with, and it's a fair question, why is it, why is it not like that now? That's the question you press me with, and it's a fair question. Do you want the answer? Well now, and I don't want to make anybody hungry, but when you bake a cake, typically there's eggs, some butter, some flour, and other ingredients, all different. But when we have mixed it together, put it in the oven, let it stay for the necessary time. Mm -hmm. We say, we've got a cake. There's a oneness about the cake mm -hmm. that we don't say, I've got flour, butter, eggs, and so on. Uh -huh. We say, we've got a cake. Even though flour ain't butter, butter ain't eggs, so on and so forth. But when they come together and they are mixed right, y'all missed it? When they come together and they blend right, when they come together and praise God right, when they come together and say thank you, Lord, right, then we can have that oneness, that thing that I just made called a cake. God will bake a cake every Sunday in this place if we show up and do what we're supposed to do and give God the praise. Open your mouth right now and tell God thank you. I don't know what he's done for you, but I know what the Lord has done for me. Somebody say, you can't tell it like I can tell it what the Lord has done for me. Somebody in here ought to realize you may have drove a car up in here today, but there was a time you had to walk where you went. But look at God. Ain't the Lord all right? What he do at church? What do you got a responsibility to come in here and tell God, thank you. And praise God for whom all blessings flow. God bless you. God keep it in my prayer. Oneness in worship. We bid you to come to Jesus, candidate for baptism, by letter of Christian experience. But as we sing this song of invitation, those who are with us virtually, you may start six on your keypad or if you're joining us with the video feed, you, there's a, a hand icon that you can touch and let us know you want to give your life to Jesus Christ today. We bid you to come to Jesus today. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus.
God to Jesus just now. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Can I tell y'all a secret? It won't be a secret after I tell you, but it's okay. Every time I show up here at church, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting God to do great things. Every time I walk through the doors of this church, I'm expecting God to show himself in a way that I have never experienced him before. And what it takes is for me to open myself to what God is doing. Listen, when you are closed up and you don't want nobody to get into your airspace, you don't allow the Lord to be able to move. Sometimes your clap is for somebody else. Sometimes it's to encourage somebody else. So if you don't think you need it right now, do it because somebody else needs it. And the day will come. You're going to need it. And then they'll be able to clap for you when you can't clap for yourself. Hallelujah, church. Oneness in worship. Oneness in worship. I used to wonder. I would hear people talk. And they would say, and they were describing their experience in the presence of the Lord, in the house of the Lord. And I, I would hear them say this, and I, even when I was younger and didn't have any, uh, as much walking with the Lord as I got now, I was still puzzled that anybody could go to the house of the Lord and leave and, and conclude Church was cold. Church was cold. That's an indictment of the person who's making the statement. Because if you got some fire, I say, if you got some fire, well, let me leave y'all alone there, but. If I got some fire in me, wherever I am, I'm going to let the fire of the Lord burn. Now, if everybody else want to be cold, that's their business. But I'm not going to allow them to try to put the fire out in me. You know what Jeremiah said? It's like a fire shut up in my boat. I know. I know I'm through preaching. But there's a fire, there's a fire, shut up in my bone. And so church, always be ready. God, 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 will, God will show up. I say church, God will show up. But you got to allow the power and the glory of the Lord to be manifest in the house of the Lord. God bless you and keep his eye prayer. Amen.